Let's talk about kindergarten for a minute, Margaret. Right. You, you mentioned that the nature of kindergarten has really changed a lot in right. a generation. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you remember, Joan. Absolutely. That, right. I mean, when we went to kindergarten, right. it was right. a time play. to play. Right. Mm -hmm. right. It was a time to be with a large group of other kids right. for the first time mm -hmm. and learn how to get along. Suddenly, kindergarten has become, oh, this is the launching pad for learning how to read. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how, mm -hmm. uh, 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 comment on that. Okay, I think it has been a, a, a real transition. Um, we've noticed that our kindergarten is much more academic in a sense and actually our focus probably is mostly on literacy skills. Uh, we do guided reading, we do managed independent learning where students go and practice literacy skills um, station to station. They learn a lot of independence which is amazing to me when I go into kindergarten what they're able to do. So um, I feel that with appropriate support, with a knowledgeable teacher, we can do those things and not stress a child. What happens, I think, again with this testing, and I, and I think it's important to note that assessment is extremely important to what we do because without that, we can't guide our own instruction. So assessment is part of that learning or that teaching cycle. It, it's an integral part. Unfortunately, some of the testing, I think as Margaret was alluding to in the standardized testing, is inappropriate for young children. And the state has moved away from that somewhat. It's more individualized in kindergarten and first grade. But then at second, and actually that's not a state test at second, but at third, we are required to give a two and a half hour state assessment in reading and math to children next week. We all know that that's an inappropriate way to assess a child. And unfortunately, um, that to me is where things are becoming misconstrued. But back to the kindergarten, it is, it is different. I think it can be very good. I think children have always come ready to read in kindergarten. And so it's, again, knowing where that child is and taking them to the next step. What about the full day, half day controversy mm -hmm. in kindergarten? We, I was actually part of the um, team that made the decision to go with full day kindergarten. At your school recently? At, at, we did it in Athens City Schools eight years ago. Um, well, my school was one of the ones that wanted the full day. Uh, partly because of our population. We have some low, some children from some low socioeconomic backgrounds. And parents need the full day. And for parents, it was a convenience. And we still incorporate some, we call it open center time, some free exploration time. So we try to, again, as I said, hit that balance of teacher-directed, student-directed activities so that they still have that time for exploration that we know is so important. I think um, that the one of the problems I see with kindergarten is the balance in many kindergartens mm -hmm. isn't enough in terms of the active involvement of children in whatever it is that they're doing. A lot of children in kindergarten and in first grade spend a lot of time sitting. And so it creates opportunities for behavior problems in classrooms. And I think that teachers have many more behavior problems because ch children don't have the opportunity to be active in the classroom. And and I you know, totally support assessment of children, but I also think that assessment can be informal assessment and teachers can mm -hmm. informally assess children and use that assessment in terms of lesson planning and doing those kinds of things and still move mm -hmm. children forward, whether they're in kindergarten or whether they're in third grade or whether they're in you know, sixth grade. I guess the other, the other piece for me is that you don't see sand and water in kindergartens anymore. You don't see block building. You don't see those kinds of things that also teach children about problem solving, about higher level concepts. And so a lot of it is paper pencil that children experience every day. So they really don't have the chance to create new meanings or I think as Roger talked about Piaget, but to basically construct their own knowledge about things. And I think that that is a real disadvantage for children because we're li because we because actually we're living in a society where those are the skills that I think that people are going to need in the long term to be able to construct their own knowledge, to be able to problem solve, to be engaged in critical thinking, in addition to learning to read. If I could just comment yeah. on what Margaret's saying, um, what's interesting about the state tests, they have a lot of negatives. But if you look at the information and the way in which the tests are designed, what the children really need is the skills that Margaret's just discussing. They need to be able to problem solve, they need to be able to critical think, and they need to be, make, be, in the, they need to be able to make an inference. Because that's what those tests are asking the children to do. It's not a real knowledge-based test. Unfortunately, for whatever reason, teachers feel that we need to be telling the children more information to get them to pass the test, which in fact it's really not true. They need to be doing more of what you're describing. Okay. And, and 
it's funny that that isn't being communicated. That, that, that to me is a real mis-message. That really what the tests are after are good things. They are that higher level thinking. We're going about it the wrong way to get them to pass that test. We're going to listen to Roger Wilkins okay. again talk about uh, how to do self-directed learning better mm -hmm. okay. in the classroom. I was director of a progressive uh, community run school for a number of years. In the uh, scheduling of the day, there were ample recesses for children to get out and have a lot of physical movement. There were things done in the classroom that supported the use of the imagination uh, and of uh, kinesthetic activities of the arts to foster imagination and creativity. A much greater opportunity if a child felt the need to get up and move around to do so as long as they respected uh, the other children and didn't interfere with the classroom. And those kinds of behaviors were fostered where the children learned that they could have their needs met as long as they respected the needs of the whole group. Um, it was also a school that emphasized to a great degree hands-on project-based learning. And so instead of uh, the, the adults predetermining small bits of information they thought the children needed, the children in-depth freely explored uh, topics through projects and let their own imagination and creativity um, really develop and emerge. So they learned at a very young age how to construct projects and how to form hypotheses and how to pursue ideas. The more fundamental processes of learning and learning how to learn. Margaret, is this what, what uh, Roger Wilkins just described? Is this something that, that you teach education students in college how to do with their students? Yes, it's something that we teach. It's interesting because we teach that, but it's also interesting sometimes when you go and see your former students out in the field. It's very easy for students to move away from mm -hmm. that. It's mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. easy for students to move away from that. Mm -hmm. And so you're constantly trying to teach them how to do that, but unless they have models out in the field to help to support that. Is it because it's easier just to go with the, with the, with it, the model that they knew as, as, as children themselves? It's easy to go with that. It's also very difficult for teachers to set up classrooms that are project-based. I mean, it's very mm -hmm. difficult. Mm -hmm. And you really do have to have that team mm -hmm. of teachers working together mm -hmm. because no one teacher can come up with all of the ideas. So you really do have to have a team of people working together. You have to have, I mean, the, you have to have planning that is very deep in terms of just, in, instead of just rote memory kinds of things so kids can actually really get engaged and stay engaged while you're working with other groups of children. And so it's very difficult for teachers to do that. And so when you move out, I think, into the field and you have a class of 20 children or 25 children or whatever you might have, it's very easy to do teacher-directed things because it, you don't have to worry, I mean you have to worry, but you don't have to worry as much about the discipline issues because everyone's doing the same thing. But if you're doing self-directed learning, you have kids all over mm -hmm. the place doing a variety of things and you have to know what every child is doing. Mm -hmm. And like Joan said, in terms of assessment, you have to also be able to assess children right. while that's going on right. and know what to do mm -hmm. the next day and the day after to keep the child moving. In a so different. it really takes quite a skill set. Yes, it does. Right. Let, let's talk about homework. And let, let, okay. me, tell, let me tell you a story. Okay. My, I have an eight-year-old nephew. Mm -hmm. And my brother called me at the beginning of this school year. So he called me in September, absolutely frantic. It was the first week of school. My nephew had been up until 10 o'clock at night doing homework in third grade, absolutely. He said, you know, and of course that means the parents are really doing the homework, not the, not the eight-year-old. Right. But this is the interesting thing that my brother pointed out to me. He had a little reading comprehension assignment where he read a paragraph and was supposed to answer questions about it. And the first question was, why did the Navajo invent the alphabet? So obviously, that's what the okay. paragraph was about. And my, my brother said he saw his son, you know, thinking, thinking, thinking. Okay, why did the Navajo invent the alphabet? And he says, maybe it's because they were in a rush and realized they had to leave a message. And, and my brother Rob says to him, <laughs> no, Levi, you're supposed to answer the question based on what's written in the paragraph. No creativity and, here. 